It's my privilege to welcome you to the house of the Lord this morning and welcome all those who are watching us on live stream this morning. The purpose of our gathering this morning is to be edified and to draw our hearts closer to our Heavenly Father. But my brethren and I greet you for the purpose of the furthering of the kingdom. For it is our responsibility to bring to our Heavenly Father a group of people prepared to be in Zion here on earth. I'd like to share with you this morning from Alma, the 17th chapter, as a form of a call to worship. And it reads as follows. And I'm going to start at 65. And now, my son, remember the words which I have spoken unto you. Trust not those secret places unto, the, unto this people, but teach them an everlasting hatred against sin and iniquity. Preach unto them repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Teach them to humble themselves and to be meek and lowly in heart. Teach them to understand every temptation of the devil with their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Teach them to never be weary of good works, but to be meek and lowly of heart, for such shall find rest to their souls. O oh, remember, my son, and learn wisdom in thy youth. Yea, learn in thy youth to keep the commandments of God. Yea, and cry unto God for all thy support. Yea, let all thy doings be unto the Lord. And whithersoever thou goest, let it be in the Lord. Yea, let thy thoughts be directed unto the Lord. Yea, and let your affections, the, the affections of thy heart be placed upon the Lord forever. Counsel the Lord in all thy doings, and he will direct thee for good. Let's join together and stand and sing number 426, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we, your, your children, your saints, gather here this day to worship you. We come to your sheep to be fed. Lord, I know you have blessed your priesthood, and they have prepared, and you have, you have blessed them with the words with which to feed us. 
But Lord, I would ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to be here, that it may bear witness to the truth of the things said, and that it may uplift and strengthen all those who do bring ministry, and that it might aid them in bringing ministry. Father, it is my prayer that all those who gather here this day might be fed, even as it is your will. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, if I uh, seem a little scatterbrained, it's just because I've been it's about how I want to present what I'm gonna what I'm gonna say this morning. Um, I'm not actually going to be going over a specific theme. I sort of wanted to talk about the ironic moments in a more grandiose way. We've gone all the way through the uh, book again, and we are starting back at the first section or pathway and this will be the third time we're going through so this is the third time I've kind of wanted to start with an overview and especially since at the recent Iranic assembly we talked more about the Iranic moments and we talked about a lot we talked about really where Our heart should be as Iranic priesthood and what the goal is and what we're going for. And the Iranic moments wasn't exactly a key part of that, but it was discussed a bit and it gave me some new insights. Um, first of all, I think, or I hope that at this point I've uh, correctly explained or demonstrated what the point of this part of the service is and what it's for. Um, the Ironic Moment booklet and uh, guide or planning is split up into seven sections or pathways and each one of those individual sections is symbolically linked and based on a step going through the tabernacle in um, when we, when we had the tabernacle in Jerusalem after the Hebrews left Egypt and were going through the desert and once they got to Jerusalem. And each of the individual <coughs> sections represents steps going through. And as we take you through, our responsibility is to demonstrate what each of those things represents and the types and shadows and how it's appl applicable to your lives. And it's really, it comes down to, as you're going through preparing, as the people in Jerusalem are going through and preparing to go to the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies, that's representative of Jesus Christ. And really what it's preparing you for is to sanctify our lives and to get us to the point where we can meet Christ and we can have celestial glory and Zion and all of these things. It's purifying ourselves through these processes. And they're all very necessary and I don't wanna to get too far into what each of them are and what they represent because we'll be doing that for the next year. But what I would like to talk about a little is sort of what I got out of the Iranic Assembly and the new ways I'm looking at this. And we talked a lot about the tribes and the tribe of Levi and the house of Aaron and those were the Aaronic of, of that time. They were who took care of the tabernacle, who took care of the temples and that was their duty, that was their job, that was their sole purpose was the taking care of it physically and making sure it was in tip-top shape and the people who were going to be going in to those temples were in tip-top shape. 
to make sure that they were in the right place in their lives, in their spiritual journey, where they would be not worthy, but prepared. And our job as Aaronic today is a mirror of that. It's fascinating how similar what we do now and what the Aaronic then do and how they relate. And a lot of that is the home ministry, going into the homes of the people around us and in, in, in the congregations and helping to enrich their lives in that way outside of church. But also the ironic moments, also be, having them be a part of the service and helping us all develop and enrich. Our and about a help the the holy and the profane. And I would consider myself fairly uh, well versed in um, the definitions of words and such, but I don't think I ever really grasped that profane is a holy religious term. Profane is the absence, is the opposite of holy. It is something that is not holy, not religious, secular. And it would seem like that would be an easy thing to know the difference of. It's right and wrong. It's good and evil. But like Mike was talking about in class today, sometimes those lines can get blurred. And sometimes we really need help seeing where those lines go gray and how they mix and what's right and wrong. What's holy and what is profane. And that starts with us. That starts with the ironic being able to see that in our own lives so that we can help all of you see that in yours. And that was a big moment for me because it just made me realize how far I have to go to be able to be the person that can help in whatever small way that might be my branch and my church develop and continue to grow. And to do that, I have to develop and I have to continue to grow. So really, I just want, I want this to be a revitalization of how we look at the erotic moments and what we're going to be getting out of them. And this is to all of the members and everyone else, but also to my brothers in the ironic to really know what we're doing here and put our full hearts into it because it's important.
wanted to just take a moment, because we're on live stream this morning, to introduce our speaker. Uh, many of us here know him. Um, it's kind of a funny thing, because I'm going to turn 57 this year, and Will is still a little kid in my mind. I've known him for a long time, or known of him, but I wanted to tell a little bit about him. And I don't mean to embarrass you in any way, shape, or form, but it's important that we know a little bit about our speaker. Uh, he's a husband and he's a father and he comes from a rich line of heritage in the Restoration Church his grandfather was David Bowerman and that means he has a huge responsibility many of you know David was instrumental in why we're here today <clears throat> and I can safely say that Will brings the Spirit of the Lord with him. He's an attorney, so you'll have to pay attention and watch the big words. But I want you to ha keep him in your prayers as he brings the bread of life to you today. And he's an elder in our church, and he serves his Heavenly Father each and every day. And we're fortunate to have him with us. Thank you, brother, very much for the uh, introduction. I don't know that I, I got past me being a little kid, which I want my wife to remember um, the next time she thinks about how old I am or not. Um, this is uh, um, a day of some first for me. Um, this will be, it has been a, a a fair amount of time since I've had the opportunity to uh, address you and to bring um, ministry and a message to you uh, on a Sunday morning. Uh, it is also the first time that I will do so with my son sitting in the audience, probably beginning a long tradition of not understanding anything I say. But it is a first for me and uh, adds, um, adds something to the uh, responsibility and the opportunity to address you this morning uh, in a way that I had not uh, thought about or experienced before. So I appreciate uh, each of you being here this morning, uh, sharing this time with me and my family. And uh, ask that the Lord uh, bless us as we discuss together his word and his desire for our lives. I want to start with two scriptures, first from Genesis and later from Romans. From the seventh chapter of Genesis, the 39th and 40th verses, the Lord said unto Enoch, Behold, these thy brethren, they are the workmanship of mine own hands. And I gave unto them their intelligence in the day that I created them. And in the garden of Eden gave I unto man his agency. And unto thy brethren have I said and also gave commandment that they should love one another and that they should choose me, their father. And from the 12th chapter of Romans, to begin our consideration this morning, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what the good 
and acceptable and perfect will of God is. This morning, I want to focus on uh, a word and what it means. It's actually not a, a big word. Um, it's agency. I want to talk a little bit about what that means and what it means to us, what, uh, what it should mean in our lives. So first off, I would ask you, what is, what is agency? And I am asking for contributions. Choice. Choice? Darren, I know you have, a, have an answer. <laughs> Freedom, I guess. Freedom? Both of those are, are correct and, and certainly um, part of what agency means. We talk about it often in terms of your free will, your opportunity to choose God. And it certainly means those things, just as it said in uh, uh, the scripture that I read at the beginning. But I also think that agency... Uh, has a, a bigger meaning and a bigger definition. It means uh, perhaps something a little bit more expansive and more important in our everyday life and our decisions that we make in each moment. In the Book of Mormon, in the first chapter of Second Nephi, is recorded uh, Lehi's blessing to his sons. And as he's discussing with them, and he, he gets to this particular point um, where he talks about, wherefore the Lord gave to man that he should act for himself, that he should be an agent and have agency. And in verse 115, he continues, Adam fell that men might be, and men are that they might have joy. And the Messiah will come in the fullness of time that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. And because they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever, knowing good and evil, to act for themselves and not to be acted upon, save it be by the punishment of the Lord at the great and last day, according to the commandments which God has given. Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given to them are given to them which are expedient to man. And they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediation of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeks that all men might be miserable like himself. Now, my sons, I would that you should look to the great mediator and hearken to his great commandments and be faithful to his words and choose eternal life according to the will of his spirit of his Holy Spirit, and not choose eternal death according to the will of flesh and the evil which is therein, which gives the spirit of the devil power to captivate, to bring you down to hell that he may reign over you in his own kingdom. I have spoken these few words to you all, my sons, in the last days of my probation, and I have chosen the good part according to the words of the prophet. I have no other object, save it be the everlasting welfare of your souls. Amen. This idea continues in the Doctrine and Covenants. Section 90. Verse 5, 
says man was also in the beginning with God into intelligence or the light and truth or the light of truth was not created or made neither indeed can be all truth is, is independent in that sphere in which God has placed it to act for itself as all intelligence also otherwise there is no existence behold here is the agency of man and here is the condemnation of man because that which was from the beginning is plainly manifest unto them and they receive not the light and that same sentiment of freedom and choice continues in other parts of the, of the uh, words that God has brought to us in latter day more than once we are told that, uh, or Christ tells us, to let every man choose for himself until I come. And I had an opportunity, uh, I expose a few years ago now, but to, to think in a different way about agency and about what it means and about how it should affect the way that we think about our decisions and our opportunities throughout the day. I was uh, sitting in a class in law school um, and ended up for that particular section of a week or so, spending up most of the time thinking about the gospel as we, as we went over our topic, because the topic that day was agency. Um, and it caused me to think about it in a way that I quite simply never had. Um, as we, in my class, went over uh, the common law in all the cases and all of the writings and uh, the basic premises of the law of agency uh, as we use it in, uh, in contracts and in, in legal settings today. It has a, a, a specific meaning and a, and a, a meaning that is different than what I thought. If you have ever seen uh, an advertisement for an insurance agency, that's part of that, that legal definition. Um, the man that sells you the insurance is an agent. He is in an agency relationship with an insurance company. They are the principal, and he has been given authority to act on their behalf and with their money and with their goods. Um, to accomplish the goals of that of that relationship and that agency that, that they set up and and in this agency principle in this legal uh, definition and, and framework of agency there are two people uh, today if you go to school and learn about it they will talk about a principal and an agent uh, the principal being the person um, whose goods, whose funds, whose authority is being used and implemented, and the agent being the servant and the person who is working for the principal and using uh, that which the principal has uh, for his gain, for the principal's gain, not, not the agent's. But if you go back a little bit farther, uh, we didn't always say principal and agent. Um, it was actually in part an idea to get a little bit away from uh, more religious sounding words. But it used to be master and agent. Uh, and then before that, it actually used to be lord and steward in, in this relationship. So agency is actually the same thing as stewardship. 
The two words are parallel to each other. And when the Lord gave us our agency, he was giving us something that includes more than just the opportunity to choose to do whatever we want or the opportunity to choose to do the right thing. There's a relationship that is, is, that is contained within in those words um, that I think means a little bit more. In a legal setting, in an agency relationship, there are specific duties and responsibilities that come along with this. An agent or steward owes to his Lord specific duties. Uh, loyalty, the duty of loyalty, the duty of obedience, the duty of reasonable care. He has an obligation to do all things for the benefit of his Lord and not at all for his own benefit. He has a, they call it a fiduciary relationship, which just means that, that I can't do anything for what is best for me. I have to do what is best for you, or in this case, what is best for my Lord. He owes the duty of obedience. Sounds familiar. We have a book of things that we need to listen to and remember. It is a duty of reasonable care to make sure as the agent or the steward has to make sure as he is exercising that agency or that stewardship that he is representing his master well. That he's not putting his master in a, in a bad position. That he's not, in a legal sense, entering into contracts that are not a part of what he actually wanted to do uh, or, or making investments that he didn't want to. Or acting in any way that is contrary to the entire purpose of this agency or stewardship relationship. So agency, agency means more than we have the opportunity to choose to do the right thing. It includes everything that we think of when we talk about stewardship. It includes the fact that everything everything that we're using, that we're exercising, that we're choosing with, it's not ours. It's our master's. It's his authority that we're using. It's his life that we're using. It's his goods that we're using. It's his money that we're using. It's his time that we're using. That all of those things that we, we think of sometimes as ours are not. That our agency implies that all of the stuff is our masters. And that we have the sole obligation to one, be loyal to him, and to two, to make sure that we use all of those things, our lives, our choices, our time, our money, our goods. If we use those things, not for the goals that we have in mind, but for the goals that our master has in mind. There is one duty in, in the law of agency that is owed by the master to the steward or the agent uh, and that's simply a compensation for the agency. Um, in contract terms, that just means that you're going to exercise all of my authority. You're going to use my money. You're going to you're going to do all the things that I want you to do. Um, and you're not even going to you're not going to do anything for yourself. You're not going to use my stuff for your gain. 
Um, in exchange for that, I'm going to pay you for it. And we have a corollary in that too, in, in our relationship with our master. Um, our compensation is not in goods, it's not in money, it's not in comforts that we get to live in. Our compensation is at the end in that discussion as Lehi referenced. Our compensation is to be able to return to him. Is to be able to hear the words at the end of a life. Well done, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. There's another concept that I, I spent a while thinking about as we went in through this class. Uh, there's, there's a number of different definitions of authority uh, that, that are painfully dissected and, and talked about what each different one means uh, in a law school class. But in, in a general sense, there, there, there was two, two points. There was actual authority and there was apparent authority. Actual authority meaning that the master actually gave you, affirmatively gave you this authority to do X, Y, and Z, to do these things. So for us, that would be that our master has actually instructed us to do all the things that are in here and to use our lives and our talents and our opportunities to further that purpose. And then apparent authority is, is not really about the master and the steward, it's about other people, uh, third parties that, that are involved in this. Because the idea behind apparent authority is that you don't actually have the authority to do what you're doing, not, a, not in an actual sense. It, it's about whether or not this other person thinks you do. And depending on a, on a, a number of different factors and reasons, um, that goes a few different ways. But, but the point there is, is that that's a, it's about a legal way to decide who's responsible for that. When, when a steward, when an agent doesn't follow all those duties that he has, when he does things that he doesn't have the authority to do, when he exceeds the authority, when he uses the things that he's been given for the wrong purpose or for his own purpose, who's responsible for that? In a legal sense, there, there are times when when a, uh, an agent can bind his master, he can make an agreement with somebody that he didn't actually have authority to do, but this person that he contracted with uh, didn't know that. He thought that he was doing the right thing, and then, then that contract is actually enforced on the master. Or the agent can so far exceed his authority or his purpose or his goal that he is responsible for the fallout of all that. That he may have, he may have made all these agreements in the name of his master and expected his master to cover that cost and to bind him to that because he was, he was acting outside of his scope and his authority, he's responsible now, personally. And I thought a lot about uh, the common saying that, that we, uh, we hear quite often that you know, you're, the only, you're the only Bible that some people will ever read. That for many people who are, for most of their lives, third parties in terms of this relationship with 
master and steward who don't have a relationship with God like you and I do. For many of them, their first window and their first opportunity to see what God and what Jesus Christ are like, who they are, is through us, is through the actions that we take, it's through what we choose to do with our agency. It's based on how we represent our Heavenly Father to the rest of the world. And it's, that's based on what we do with our agency, what we make, what choices we make, even in the smallest of things. That's the other side of agency is that, is that all of the decisions that we make and all of the things that we do paint a picture and they describe what our Father and what, our, what this gospel is to those around us. And in many ways, and many times, that's as far as they go. Many times, their decision about what God is like starts and ends with their experience with one person who was a believer and they didn't like what they did. So in that sense, the steward is moving beyond his authority. He's acting outside of it. He's doing it for the wrong reasons. And he's actually in the mind of this other person, sealing in and binding his version of what what religion's all about, what God is, who he is. And he's responsible for that. The steward. And I want to turn back to a familiar scripture that I assume that we're probably talking about in a number of places this morning from the 25th chapter of Matthew. There is found the parable of the talents. And I want to, I want to read this uh, and I would like to, to think about it in, in in the sense of the, the agency relationship and the stewardship relationship that we're talking about. It starts with verse 14. For it is like as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability and straightway went on his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and gained other five talents. And likewise, he who received two talents, he also gained the other two. But he who had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, you gave me, thou deliverest unto me five talents, and behold, I gained besides them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two talents besides them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. 
Thou hast been faithful over few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou did not where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not scattered. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth and lo, here's thy talent. Take it from me as thou hast from my, thine other servants for it is thine. The Lord answered and said unto him, O wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest that I reap where I sow not and gather where I have not scattered. Having known this, therefore thou oughtest to have put my money to the exchangers, and at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. I will take therefore the talent from you, and give it unto him who has ten talents. For unto every one who hath obtained other talents shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. And from him that hath not obtained other talents shall be taken away even that which he receiveth. And his Lord shall say unto his servants, Cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I know we all know that that story is not really about money. But it is about... Uh, that agency relationship that I, were, I was talking about. Where the Lord left, and went on a journey, entrusted to the three servants all of his stuff. According to the abilities that they had, they were given different things to use and to watch over and to grow while he was gone. And we don't really know what either any of them did in this story. But the two of them took what their Lord had given them and put it to good use. They used the goods and they used the opportunity and the time that they had to do what their master would have wanted. And the other was at least according to what he said, was so afraid of losing that he did nothing. That he, he didn't participate in this steward-master relationship at all. He took the, the, received the goods that he had and then he went and hid them all away, did nothing and waited until the Lord came back and then walked up to him and said, hey, here's your talent, the one that you gave me. I, ha I have done nothing with it. It is completely clean and unspotted from the world. It is exactly as the day that you gave it to me. Here you go. And that man represented someone who hadn't, hadn't participated in any of this relationship. They hadn't exercised any of his responsibilities, hadn't made any choices, hadn't made, done any work, hadn't used any of his talents. Hadn't done anything. And so the others who received their reward, their compensation from their master, who were told, well done, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Except for the one who didn't, didn't participate, who wasn't willing to be an agent, to be a steward, wasn't willing to 
act on behalf of their master and work for him. And therefore he did not receive any reward or compensation. You know, as I, uh, as I have gotten older, as hopefully some people don't think I have, but as I've gotten older, my thinking has changed on, on some things, this one in particular about our agency and our life and our opportunities. When I was a young man, I used to think in terms of doing some great and glorious huge thing and, and then that was that was going to be everything thought in terms of going out in a blaze of glory of, of you know like the shooting star that everybody sees it lasts for like five seconds but everybody sees it I used to think about life in that way that, that there, there needed to be some great work some, some, some huge thing that you were going to do uh, that you would hang your head on there then I joined the army and, and thankfully did not get the opportunity to go down in a blaze of glory And then uh, had a little bit more life experience. And life and, and our, our agency and you, your and I stewardship uh, has come to me to mean more about a collection of small things. Because in the end, to God, there, there, there is no small thing. They're all big. And I, I think I came to this, this uh, or at least some of this understanding, uh, watching my grandfather as he got older and uh, dealt with the issues that were his to deal with uh, as his health left him and his ability to, to do with a lot of the things that he used to be able to do or that he thought was presumably thought was that, that, that was just him what he what he could always do as, as he became more limited and and then it became more about his ministry became more about the the smaller things the the moments that he would have with you or the one thing that it would be able to say in a phone call. Um, as I watched him do that and, and I, I came to, I was able to see what enduring meant and came to, I think, understand that, that it's not about doing, doing some great huge thing that that everybody will remember or that everybody will see. Um, the stewardship is about the long haul. It's, it's not about the big thing that you do in one moment. It's about the things that you do every day, day in and day out, for a lifetime. It's about the decisions that you make in each moment, even when nobody's watching. Because your master is. That's what our stewardship's really about. What our agency is about. It's about being being a rock, being being somebody 
who continues to work and to, to live and to, to be the servant that God asks of him to be and has called him or her to be each and every day for 70, 80, 90, 100 years. And even in the moments when, when we're down, when we don't think we can do much, when we think we only have one talent, even in those moments when we feel limited in what we're able to do, to use that one, to find the way that we can provide a ministry, the way that we can be a light, the way that we can share in, in whatever way that is possible for us. And no matter how small, no matter how big, no matter how seemingly insignificant to us, to take, take the time, to take the actions, to do whatever we can, to stand as the son and daughter child and steward of God that we've been asked to be. And today is Stewardship Sunday, so I know we talk, have talked and, and we'll take up an offertory in, in a moment uh, regarding our uh, tithing statements. That's one thing. That's one step. That's one uh, part of those decisions and that stewardship that, that one does day in and day out. Seems like a small thing. But as I said, there are no small things. There are no insignificant things to God. And so I would ask you on today and tomorrow and every other day after that to think about what God has given to you, which is everything. And to think about how you can use it for his will in your day to day. To think about what you can do going forward to serve his purposes in your life and in the lives of the people that will see you today. And to continue to strive to prove and to show through your life who God is to those around you. And I would end with the scripture that I started with from the 12th chapter of Romans. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is.
like to share a few thoughts with you this morning about uh, Stewardship Sunday. You know, uh, the Lord requires of us a broken heart and a contrite spirit. But all things, all things are both physical and spiritual. And today we're going to have an offering. And hopefully you've prepared your tithing statements. Because all good stewards need to make an accounting. And I wanted to just share a thought with you about that accounting. You know, you can't really be grateful for the blessings that you've been given or for anything you've been given if you don't take note of it. And our stewardship is that way. To take note of it, to write some things down and to realize how much you've been blessed. It's a gift, really. And we've been promised that because we take a note of our physical blessings, we will be richly blessed. Let me share with you a couple of scriptures, one from Malachi, the third chapter. Will a man rob God, yet ye have robbed me? But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the house, into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now wherewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour, out, pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And, this, and the opposite of that is this. If we don't take, make an accounting, behold, now it is called today until the coming of the Son of Man. And verily, it is a day of sacrifice and a day of the tithing of my people. For he that is tithed shall not be burned at his coming. For after today cometh the burning. This is speaking after the manner of the Lord. For verily I say, tomorrow all the proud and they that do wickedly shall be as stubble. And I will burn them up, for I am the Lord of hosts, and I will spare, I will not spare any that remaineth in Babylon. Let me repeat that. And I will not spare any that remaineth in Babylon. Wherefore, if ye believe me, ye will labor while it is called today. Will the brethren please come forward? pray with me. O oh God, our eternal Heavenly Father, we ask Thee at this time that You would bless these offerings that have been given, that, and bless the hands, Father, that uh, distribute these funds. And Father, we pray a special blessing on those who have uh, found this deadline appropriate in their lives to make their accounting with You and to be right with You in the financial things of their lives. And Father, we pray also that you'll be with those who struggle, who yet have to fill out their tithing statements to bring an accounting before you. 
that ye may bless them, that they may do all things in righteousness and justice before you. Father, it is our humble prayer that you bless the hearts of those who give this day. And these things we pray in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Father, may our gratitude for the spirit that has attended us and for the message of thy servant be acceptable and heard at the feet of thy throne. And may that same spirit depart with us, watch over us, until we should meet again together to worship you. This benediction I pronounce in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>